We're going to be opening up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Nothing like starting at the beginning, right? Um, in the study of the Bible, when you go to Bible school, to seminary, one of the first things they teach you is how to study the Bible. Because it's one thing to read the Bible, it's another thing to actually study it. And one of the principles, and I've mentioned this before, is the principle of first mention or first use. How uh, the first use of a word, whether it be in the Hebrew or the Greek in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, or if you're using the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. The first use sets the tone for the definition of that word throughout the whole Bible. Because there's numerous definitions for, for words, but you can, you can get from it the underlying tone, at the very least, of the word. And so that's what we're going to be turning to today in, first gen, in Genesis 1, chapter 3 through 4. This is the continuing sermon series, the God is series. Um, this is part 9. It's not the ninth characteristic. This is the 11th characteristic that we're talking about today, that God is good. This is the second part. We also talked about God being good last week and what that meant. And uh, today I'm focusing on when the goodness of our God means suffering. <clears throat> and the reason why I'm taking the time to do two parts for this one attribute is because it applies directly to us and, and how God moves in our lives um, how he does things in our, in, our, in our lives and what his purposes are in our lives. And, you know, he created us for his glory first and foremost. He created us to enjoy him and to bring him glory. All right. And the, the plan of God, I mean, it, it, to simplify it, <clears throat> Adam and Eve were born, and they were born, uh, well, they weren't born, they were created in the image of God. Man and woman, he created them, all right? And then the fall happened, and we fell away from him into sin. And so to, to that degree, which is from here to infinity, because a, sin, a person in sin cannot be in the presence of God and cannot and will not be saved of their own merit. They can't, it's impossible. And so from that point on, God started revealing the plan of salvation for mankind, that a fallen humanity, people, men, women, who no longer resemble the image of God outside of a very basic um, similarity, our character, our morality is our spirits are utterly fallen, so much so that it can be said for a person that does not know Jesus that their spirit is dead. That's why it's called, he says in John chapter 3, you must be born again. If you didn't have a spirit, you'd die right now. So in a very real sense, your spirit is still alive. But as far as its relationship with the Lord, as far as its ability to commune with God, it is dead. That's how dead it is. It's dead. And I talked last week about Lazarus, how Lazarus being dead and in a tomb could not raise himself, utterly unable to raise himself. It was only by the command of God, rise, that Lazarus came back to life. So it's impossible for us to be redeemed to God outside of his moving in our lives. And so... <clears throat> Having moved in our lives, having saved us, having brought our spirits, regenerated our spirits, brought our spirits back to life. That's what regeneration means. You were regenerated, right? Think of a generator that turns on. It goes, Wee! right? That's what happened with your spirit. From that day on, God has been doing a work in you called sanctification. On that day, you were immediately sanctified. It's called immediate. This is all doctrine I'm teaching you. This is called immediate sanctification. Your spirit was raised back to life and utterly perfected in that moment. So much so that the Bible tells us that our spirits are seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. Now, your spirit is in your body, but it's making a statement of your spiritual perfection. Unfortunately, 
That doesn't include your mind, your heart, or your body. That's undergoing a process called progressive sanctification. And in your Bible, some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may not be, but one of the verses, I don't know exactly where it is off the top of my head, but it says that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. All right? Now, it's not saying that Jesus was born a sinner. He was not born a sinner. He was born sinless. But he was born an infant who became a toddler. Right? Who became an adolescent. Who became an adult. So there was a learning process for him in his humanity. Okay? But for us, we are being, I'm going to use several words. We are being conformed. We are being transformed. We are being made into the image of Jesus Christ. In spirits already there. In mind, in heart, and in body. When I say body, I mean, I mean in deed. In the things that you do. You're being conformed into the image of Christ. And obviously, what does that mean? Sinner. Sinless. That's the process, and it's called progressive sanctification. And I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. The primary mode of that sanctification is suffering. And so we're being stripped. Um, the Bible says that we're being washed with, uh, with uh, fuller's soap. It's acid soap. Being, imagine being scrubbed with an acid soap, how that would feel on your body. Not comfortable, all right? We are being chiseled, right? I'm using biblical terms here. We're being molded. In other words, you're being pressed and pulled and shaped. None of these speak of comfort. They all speak of a discomfort. So, that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, you can go to slide number two. Our first verse I want to start with is um, the first use of the word good. Genesis 1, 3 through 4. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. So without even looking at the word, we can know that goodness is an equivalent to light, right? Light is referred to as good. So all things good, and we know from the New Testament, have to do with things that are of the light. But it is opposed by darkness. Therefore, there's a, a separation between light and and darkness. So, if light is good, darkness is bad. Well, pastor, I mean, you know, so. So, lying is a covering of the truth. Therefore, lying is darkness. Lying is bad. Holding back information. Now, you're not called to tell everybody every single thing about your life. But if you're in a marriage relationship, let's just use that for example. Or, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend. And you're, they're madly in love with you, but you're kind of, you know, you're kind of playing the field. So you don't tell that other person that you're actually dating other people. Darkness. It's not light. It's hidden. It's covered. Sin. Bad. All right, very uh, basic. I'm giving this to you in very basic terms. This good, this bad, you know. We're going to expand from here. The word good is the word tov in Hebrew. It's pronounced T-O-W-V, tov. Of all the definitions of good, the one used in this place and context indicates God's goodness as, and here's the definition, beneficial, of benefit. Of benefit to, to who? Well, the light is good, and light in creation benefits what? Every, every single living thing is benefited from the light because it is good. 
So when we think about what we go through in our lives, both the peaceful, pleasant times and the painful times of trial, those painful times of suffering, of anxiety, of pressure, we can see um, this first use in this first use definition, the reason. These things, all of them, are ultimately for our benefit and or the benefit of others. And I added that in. You know, uh, Romans 8, 28, God uses all things for the good who, for those who are called according to his purposes. All right? And I think of Job, and I think of Job going through all his suffering. And I, at first, last week when I talked about Job, I talked about how God used all of his suffering for his good. And I think there's truth in that. I think maybe Job was being shown the faithfulness of God. I think that um, Job's faith was tested. But you know where I think the ultimate good came? I think it came to you and to me. You know why? Because we have a book of Job where we can read about this man's experience of being tested by Satan so severely that you will never experience anything that comes even close to what Job went through. And that here was a man who kept his faith. And you read it all the way through, and what you see is Job is tested severely. His wife asks, tells him, why don't you just curse God and die? She's lost everything. She's lost all her wealth. She's lost all her children. She's not happy. That Job finally says, Lord, I wish I was never born. And then his three friends show up, and they're just kind of telling him, it's your fault. You're a sinner. You did this. You did this. God wouldn't do this if you didn't sin. This is all on you, all on you. And Job's defense is, look, man, I didn't do anything. And he was right. But then he became critical of God. And then so the second half of Job is just God speaking to his three friends and to Job and Job responding. But God is basically reading Job the riot act. Who do you think you are? That I, you don't think I have prerogative, God says, over your life to bring rain and to bring sun? To bring comfort and to bring pain? You think that I don't, I don't deserve, the, I don't have the authority or the privilege or the right as your creator to do these things? Even when I say to you that every one of these things I will use for your good, you still say, no, you don't have a right to give me pain. And, and all I could think of is, the, uh, is the, one of the Thor movies where um, the Hulk takes this bad guy and he slams him back and forth on the ground because he, he was like, how dare you try to stop me? Don't you know I am God? And, and he slams on God and he walks away and looks at him and he goes, puny God. And that's what we are. We, we, we try to assert over God a predominance. To say that we have the right to dictate to him what our lives should look like. And he says, uh-uh. I don't care whether you're saved or not. Now, if you're not saved and you don't know the Lord, you can live your whole life being king or queen of your life. But my, bro my friend, I can't call you brother and sister if that's you. My friend, when you die, you will stand before a judge who will have prerogative over you and will judge you and you will have zero impact on the carrying out of that sentence. I'm talking about hell. I'm talking about eternal torment. And I don't want to see anybody have to go through that. So does that mean nobody should? No, God knows better than me. And one day we will understand when those that we thought they don't deserve hell... And, and we're watching them be judged by God, and we're watching how they defend themselves or react. And you know how the Bible says they react? With weeping and gnashing of teeth. Tears coming down, but not in, please help me, I'm sorry, but in hatred. Ripping into him before the very great white throne. And you'll, you'll watch this, and you'll go, well, I didn't realize that was in them, you know? So let's not be ignorant. Under the umbrella statement and promise for the believer that God uses all things for our good, we have causes for suffering. 
And there's two main reasons why believe, believers suffer. And that's what I want to talk to you about for now. All right? The first reason why we suffer. We sin. <laughs> Don't you know sin never has a good outcome? All right? You might enjoy drinking. So you drink and you get drunk and you're like, this ain't so bad. And so you drink and you get drunk. You always wake up with a hangover, first of all. You get your relatively immediate negative ramification. But keep drinking. And it'll go beyond your hangover to losing your job, to losing your wife, to losing your husband, to losing your house, to your children not even wanting to be around you anymore. And homelessness. I mean, it just keeps going on and on and on. And if you, if you don't repent, cirrhosis and death. I worked in a funeral home for 13 years. I saw a lot of death by cirrhosis of alcoholics. All right? And I could attach the same kind of um, pattern to crack, to cocaine, to heroin, to crystal meth. I could attach the same... Here's where I'm going to get controversial. I could attach the same pattern to homosexuality. I could attach it to lying, to stealing, to adultery. You see, you don't see the immediate effects. I'm getting into something here where they don't manifest immediately the depth of suffering and torment these things are going to bring you. But the Bible tells us that in heaven, there will be no homosexuals, no, no practicing liars, no practicing. And it's all practicing, practicing, practicing. That's the implication. Somebody who has not turned from these ways and minimally their heart has turned to God and they're waging a fight that they may not be always winning. But they're in that fight. Instead, they're just embracing that and living that. So you could live your whole life in a peaceful homosexual union only to be judged for never repenting. I can't believe he's up there saying that. I mean, that is really hateful. No, it's not. It may be the most loving thing you hear. That there's a heaven and there's a hell and that there's a creator and it's his prerogative to set the moral standards for his creation. Because he desires that you would turn to him. He desires that you would repent. That means simply turn back to him. Start living for him. We sin. Job did not suffer because he sinned. He suffered because God saw that he needed to be tested. Not a check in the box testing. But a testing of shaking where the roots have to go down deeper. How many of you know when you go through a joyful time and you're praising God, it's good, right? No one's going to complain about that. I'm certainly not going to. But how many of you know that when you go through a time of trial, of burden, of torment, of pain, and you come through it as a believer, I don't care if you backslid or not, you come through it as a believer that you have deeper roots in God. Because you have come to understand that you got through it, maybe even in spite of yourself, that God was so faithful to you that he brought you through. That will change you for the better. But even for believers, many times the suffering comes as a result of the ungodly choices we have made in our minds and carried out in the flesh. Galatians 6, 7 through 8 tell us this. Do not be deceived. This is the Apostle Paul. I got to stop here for a second. Father God, please be with me. Be with the us, Lord. May your truth be preached today. May we bring glory to you, to your word, to your son, to your spirit. For you are worthy. We love you, Lord. Amen. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Galatia. Galatia was a predominantly Gentile, non-Jewish area that also had some Jews, but it was predominantly non-Jewish. So this church was non-Jewish. And Judaizers came from Jerusalem. They were 
professing Christians, but they came to this church and they started telling them, we're glad that you're, you're a believer in Jesus. However, in order to be a true believer in Jesus, you must become a Jew and practice the Mosaic law. And Paul, most of this book is Paul rebuking these Judaizers because they're wrong. You, my friend, are not called to be a Jew. You're called to be a new man or woman in Christ Jesus. Okay? Anyway, this is what he says in chapter 6 of that book. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Your choices have consequences. Do not be fooled. God isn't mocked. Whatever you do, whatever you sow, that will you also reap. If you do good, you will get good results. If you do bad, you will get bad results. For the one who does things, I'm trying to say this in modern language, the one who does things to satisfy their own fleshly desires the desire for pleasure, the desire to numb yourself, the desire to have control, the desire to get revenge, will from the flesh reap corruption. None of these things will bring you good. But the one who sows to the Holy Spirit, the one who sows to the Spirit of God, does things that are worthy, godly, Listed in this book as good things, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is just. Think upon these things, we are told. And they will reap from the Spirit eternal life. So we see we will sow, uh, we will reap what we sow. When God acts according to our sin, he acts in discipline towards us, for we are his children. When, when you sin and bad things happen, that is God allowing those bad things to happen as a chastisement on you. Do you know what the word chastise in the Greek? It's actually in the, the New Testament, and we looked it up yesterday because it's in Hebrews 12 where it's, he says that he chastises us. You know what that word means? It's the, the actual meaning? Scourge. Who in the Bible got scourged that we know of? Jesus. That means whipped. That means having a whip with metal spikes, uh, bone shards, and metal balls in it slash against your back, ripping it open. It's not a pleasant word. He scourges us. It's meant for our correction. It's meant for our transformation. You see, it's not eternal hell. I mean, any of you know who's a parent when your child goes to put their hand on a red hot uh, burner, you're going to grab them hard. You might even swat their hand. You might even swat their rear end. Not pleasant, right? You aren't called to be your child's friend first. You're called to be their parent first. God is your parent first. He's the father so you may be a friend of God, but don't ever let that overcome the whole idea that he is God. He is Lord. He is your father in heaven, first and foremost. And as a loving father, he will chastise you. He disciplines his children. Our suffering then comes from our own sinful decisions and their consequent behaviors. Decision in the mind, behavior carried out. This, a decision in the mind is non-material. It's still sin, by the way. Jesus made that clear when he talked about adultery in the New Testament. If you've even looked at someone to lust after them, you've committed adultery with them already in your heart. You see, Jesus didn't come to say that there's no law and everyone can go to heaven and it's just a free-for-all. No, he doubled down on the law. The law says don't commit adultery. Well, listen to this. Don't even think a lustful thought. And the whole purpose is this. For you to go, there's no way I can be saved. Game over, man. 
And he goes, exactly. For what's impossible for you, I can do to you. Because I am God. And that's why my son hung on a cross for you. To save sinners. <laughs> Hallelujah. And in this scenario, we see that God decides what is and is not sin. And God decides his appropriate response to our sin. Be it in his hand of discipline, which is painful, but check it out. In the absence of his hand of discipline. And I'll discuss that shortly. That's not a good thing. You don't ever want to get to a point in your life with your compromise with the word of God and in your life and your morality that God stops disciplining you. Because that day, when that day comes, you can know you're lost. It tells us in Hebrews, what father who doesn't love their children, uh, who, what father who loves their children doesn't discipline them? Therefore, you know by your being disciplined by him, by your being chastised by him, that he still loves you. And when he stops, you know that you are no longer in his favor. You, are, you know what he calls? Illegitimate. You're illegitimate. That would, be a, that would be a fancy word for false believer. All right? The second reason why believe, believers suffer. God deems suffering as necessary for you. It doesn't always have to be because you sinned. Sometimes God just brings troubles. He brings the rain. Sun comes, rain comes. All right? Now, the sun comes on unbelievers. And the rain falls on unbelievers and believers alike. This is a universal thing that happens. What God does with those things to the individual is not a universal thing that happens. He promises to use them for your benefit. Remember the word good in Genesis 1? For your good, of benefit to you. So Job didn't commit sin. And yet God allowed what we could almost describe as some sort of sadistic game to be played on him by Satan. At God's instigation and with God's permission. But if that's all we see, if that's what we see, we miss the truth of the matter completely and have bypassed or overruled God in defining his character and morality. For if God is good, then he could not allow what happened to Job for the sake of a game. You see? If you believe God is good, then you cannot land on, I read Job, what a sadist. I don't want to worship this God. You know who did that? Oprah Winfrey did that. More specifically, she read the verses where God says, I am a jealous God. And she read that and she went, well, I don't want to worship a God who's so pit, uh, petty that he exhibits jealousy. And that was her turning point. She walked away from God. Now, she will tell you she's a believer, but her God is not the Christian God. It's a new age God. And she'll call him Jesus or God. She'll say it's our God, but it's not. How do I know? It doesn't conform to this word. That's how I know. It's easy. But what she fails to understand and what we don't understand is that when God says he is jealous, it doesn't mean what, when you say you're jealous. It's two different things. You see, because God is never sinful in jealousy. We are. Second Corinthians 4, 16 and 17 and 18 say this. This is now the same guy, the Apostle Paul. He's talking to another church in a place called Corinth. This church is comprised of many Jewish and some Gentile believers. Actually, no, it's many Gentile and some Jewish believers. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You see, what Paul is doing here is he is showing you the benefit of your suffering within a Christian worldview, a Christian framework. 
He's showing us what the suffering is accomplishing in you. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. What does that even mean, Pastor? When you go to heaven, or he comes back and we're on the new earth, God is bringing his glory with him. I'm talking about the illuminating, shining brightness of his radiating holiness and perfection. And it will appear brighter than the sun. All right? The closest I can give you is in Matthew, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus, for these guys, for Peter, James, and John, he, he unclothed his humanity and showed them his glory. And when he did so, it went totally bright. All right? But there's another um, attribute to this glory and its weight. Now, it's not like you'll be like, oh, man, this glory is so heavy, I can't carry it. No, it won't be like that at all. What it's saying is it's thick, it's dense, it's impenetrable. And you're being prepared to be a carrier of that. Because he loves you if you are his. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen. I'm not looking at the suffering I'm going to. I'm looking past it, Lord. Yes, I'm feeling it. Yes, I'm going through the emotional turmoil. I'm going through the pain, physical, mental, emotional, but I'm looking past it to the good you're bringing through it for my benefit, my eternal benefit. Temporally, it may not be so great, Right? Ask Job. He went through it worse than you ever will. Ask Jesus. He went through it worse than you ever will. For the things that are seen are transient. What does that mean? The things that you go through, whether it's good times or bad, they're all temporary. And transient takes it a step further. Temporary says is it for a limited amount of time. Right? Transient says, and it's going to go by quick. <laughs> and you can't see this now, and I can't see this now, not in its fullness, because we are here stuck on a human timeline called lifespan. You're going to live anywhere from zero to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. But 10,000 years from now, you're going to go, man, that, one, that was nothing. That was this. And that's what we should be looking towards. And understand that God is always working good in our lives, whether it's through pain or happiness. Pain or comfort. Well, I believe Job was a real historical man. When I read his story, I see Job as a picture of the believer in Christ, to whom God has committed himself for the refining and transforming of you and I into heavenly beings, into God's image and character. And a great part of the book of Job, as I said earlier, has to do with God kind of reaming Job out and saying, do you know who I am? Do you know what I have done? I, I'm the dude that makes the high tide come and go. I'm the dude that causes, I'm the God. I, I don't want to demean him by saying, dude, I am the God who causes the sun to rotate around this planet. And even though the sun is infinitely bigger than the earth and has a gravity corresponding to its size, I do not allow the earth to be sucked into it. And you're going to question me? You see, because if we learn the lessons of Job, we, we, don't, we don't only walk through it going, God really means all the bad for good. I mean, that's one of the things we should walk away with, that life is painful, but ultimately he has our good in mind. But that he is worthy. We can trust him because he is almighty. He is the creator of all. And he has promised those who are his a good end. Amen, Which is actually a good beginning, isn't it? If, we, if we're speaking in terms of eternity. Yeah. 
And so this is a main reason for the book of Job, that God, through Job's testing, was teaching us about who he is and about trusting God and persevering in the face of struggles because we know he has our good in mind. And he's just conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. And there are things in us that got to go. And suffering is how they go. If we are faithful. If we're not faithful, we'll just hate him more. Right? We'll, we'll, walk, we'll become even more rebellious. It's all futile. He's almighty. He will have his way. Either in your salvation or in your damnation. So do not lose heart, my beloved, my brothers and sisters who are in this room, on Facebook, on Zoom. Do not lose heart. We may be wasting away. We're getting older. We're getting arthritis, back pain. Uh, we get ill. We get gray hair. And then one day we get sick and we die. <laughs> or maybe we just go to bed and we die. All right. But we're going to die. We're all wasting away. Each getting older with every passing day, coming closer and closer to our own mortality revealed in death. To the day when we will see Jesus face to face. And he will finish the good work he began. He will perfect the work he began. Not in your spirit. He perfected it on day one. In your mind in your heart, and in your body. Amen? I could just end here, but I got more. But God in us, His Holy Spirit, is keeping our spirits always as if brand new, perfect, awaiting that glorious day when our bodies, minds, and hearts are fully caught up with it in holiness. And what can, we, what can seem so long and dragged out in this life Trust is needed here. Understand. These sufferings are preparing you and I to be clothed in eternal, in an eternal, dense glory covering. God's own glory covering us for all of eternity. To which nothing on this earth could even compare. It, it can't be described to you. There's, there's nothing to compare it with. I mean, think about that in light of, do you ever look into the sun? You can only do it for X amount of seconds before you can't do it anymore or you go blind. You know, if you stare at the sun long enough, you'll go blind. It'll burn your, your retina, all right? But the way to God's glory doesn't even compare. A nuclear bomb going off, the flash, doesn't even compare. He is real and he is holy and he is supernatural and he is creator and he has prerogative over his creation. So nothing on earth or our own personal experience can relate to or compare with God's glory. So how? Romans 5, 1 through 5, slide number 5. I'll wait a second because Riley's, there you go. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Everyone, can you say hallelujah to your sufferings? I know. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And I want you to just stay with that slide for a second. Don't think for a moment that Paul's shouting hallelujah every time he's suffering, all right? He is feeling real pain. His body feels the pain. 
But he's making a statement of faith that we all should be able to attain to. If he could, because he's human, just like we are. There was nothing special about Paul in his being. We can at least come to a, a state in our minds and the suffering where I can go, praise you, Lord. I'm feeling the pain. I'm not comfortable. I don't like this. I want it to end, but praise you, Lord, because I trust you are doing this. To do what? You are doing this, producing in me endurance. What's endurance? Endurance keeps going in spite of. That's endurance. Think of a football player running to the goal, the end zone, and, he's, and there's a guy holding on, and he makes it. He drags him the last 10 yards. That's endurance. He doesn't fall. And that will produce character in you. What's character? All the things that are of God. Removing the things that aren't of God, putting in the things that are of God, strengthening them, growing them. Character. And the natural result of that is your hope increases. Now, I got to stop here for a second because Christian hope is not secular hope. Secular hope goes, I sure hope I make it to heaven. Christian hope goes, I can't wait till I get to heaven. You see, there's a certainty there. That's the definition of Christian hope. And so in that hope, you are never put to shame during those sufferings and trials. You may have to repent of something or two. But you're never put to shame. You know why? Romans uh, 8.1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Huh? Is, did I have it right? Oh, okay. I thought somebody said something. I could have it wrong. I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure it's 8. Okay, 8.1. There's therefore now no... I'm getting old. All right? There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So your hope will never put you to shame. And look, throughout all of this, you're not perfect. You still got your flaws, your foibles. So your hope as you grow as a believer will not be put to shame because God's love is being, has been poured out in your heart is being poured out into your hearts and will continue to be poured out into your hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to each one of you at your conversion, at your regeneration. How do I know? You would not have been regenerated if he wasn't in you. Impossible. Can you see your character change by endurance to becoming a more hopeful person? These will first be manifest, all of these things, inside your mind. Every sin begins in your mind and then is manifest. Well, so does hope. So does endurance. It manifests in your mind and then it manifests through your behaviors. In individual words and deeds. Of themselves, endurance and hope are immaterial. They have no substance. You can't touch them. You can't feel them. They are unable to be seen until they are put into practice. Manifest through your body into the world around you. Not just for you. You're meant to shine on others. You're meant to spread that hope onto others. You're enduring for the sake of others. So practice these things, brothers, sisters. Practice them. I don't know what happens with your heads each, to each week when you leave here. I don't know if you actually have determined in your life that you would start practicing Christian virtues. Hope, love, charity, joy, peace, long-suffering. Practice them. Lord knows you get enough opportunities during the week, right? With things that happen. Myself included. Practice these things. Having our thoughts and understanding not based on what we are feeling and experiencing in any given moment in our bodies and minds and hearts, but instead based on what we cannot see. The spiritual realm, our eternity, 
Not what, we, what you may be going through in the flesh, but what God is doing to you and in you in the spirit. Hebrews 2.10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. This is speaking of Father God, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, in reference to his son, Jesus, second uh, member of the triune Godhead, the person of God in physical form, Jesus. It was fitting that he, the Father, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, that's you and us, you and I, should make the founder of their salvation, Jesus, perfect through suffering. And by the way, the reason it says many sons to glory isn't because it's omitting the women. It's using the term sons as the firstborn son, like the primogenitor. In other words, the sons get the inheritance. The women get married off. Their inheritance comes through their husband from his parents. Sons get their parents' inheritance, and that's who we are. All right. As Jesus' perfection was manifest to us by his reaction to his sufferings and by going through his crucifixion, so are we made perfect by the same vehicle, suffering. So if suffering in the lives of God's children is that thing, that tool of God used in our refinement and transformation, then that suffering is good. So in the words of James in James 1.12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Now, this happened to someone else before you. This happened to Jesus. Except the crown he got was a far greater crown. He got the crown to the kingdom of God when he ascended. We get, we get made princes and princesses with the crown of life. Now, suffering towards unbelievers. Let's talk about that for a moment. Psalm 145 verse 8 tells us, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. All right, that that refers to everybody, unbeliever and believer alike. God's goodness is manifest in the life of unbelievers. God's goodness is manifest in in the lives of unbelievers. How? His mercies are new every morning. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love, chesed, I spoke about earlier, of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, Great is your faithfulness. Now, I can obviously apply that to me in my life because I make mistakes. I, I get into places of hopelessness, lack of faith. I need to know that his mercies are new to me every morning. Every morning's a new day. But this works for unbelievers as well. How? 2 Corinthians 6 2. In a favorable time, I have listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And that promise holds true to every unbeliever for every living and breathing day of their lives. They can repent and believe. And so they will never be able to stand before God at the great white throne judgment and say they didn't have enough chances, they didn't have enough opportunity, they didn't know, they didn't this, they didn't that. They had their whole lives. Every moment. Every day. His mercies were towards them would be new every morning. They were able to get saved every day. And they will be held accountable for their decision. Second point towards unbelievers. His goodness prevents God from simply destroying them all now. 
He has committed to allowing every human being their lifetime to live. They have free will and they can make choices. Instead of bearing the long suffering towards the wicked, the unsaved every day. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. His goodness prevents God from simply destroying all now. Instead, oh, instead he bears the long suffering. He he bears with long suffering the wicked every day. That's that's what it meant when I said it. It didn't make sense to me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Here's what this isn't saying. This is a common mistake. This is not saying this. For God loves everyone so much that uh, so much every day and eternally that he sent Jesus that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's not what it says. And you've heard, uh, I, I'm sure you've heard that either a preacher in the pulpit or somebody out on the streets witnessing or on TV speaking to unbelievers, God loves you so much. God does not love unbelievers. God hates unbelievers. He hates wickedness. His love towards unbelievers, towards the world, is that action on the cross. That is his statement of love to every human being. You can be saved. And that stands as that singular uh, epitome, climactic act of love towards all of humanity. But my friends, there will not be a single soul God sends to hell that will boast of God's eternal love for them. And if you look in your Bible, look up, uh, do a search on Google. This is what you type. You go, God loves every sinner verse. And then see what you pull up. It'll pull up all the references. And you can see, or, or then you could try this, try the opposite. This is how I do study when, I, when I'm looking for verses. I'll type in, all right, so God loves every sinner verse. All right, I got, my, I got some verses. I wrote a couple down. Now I'm going to type in, God hates the sinner verse or verses, and then I'll pull up all the scriptures. Now, this sermon is not on this, but I almost feel like I should do a sermon on it because God does not love the unsaved. God hates when people sin. As a matter of fact, he hates it so much that when the sinner stands before the throne of God, he will condemn them to hell. Because they've lived a lifetime of never repenting. And, and in, in light of the gospel, in never repenting, you know what they did? Who's the agent of salvation? Who regenerates a soul? No. But that's the Holy Spirit's job. So if you have had many opportunities to come to Jesus and you reject it for your whole life, what have you done? You've blasphemed The Holy Spirit, by rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you cannot be forgiven for that. Now, the fact that he's not like in this adoring love of every unbeliever should not make you feel like he's doing something wrong. Because that John 3.16 stands every day. That 2 Corinthians verse is the day of salvation for every single person. His mercies are new every morning. He called the Pharisees sons of the devil. And if he called them that because they were relying on works to be saved, it applies to the unsaved as well. You see? And so that act of love, he could not love any greater than sending his own son, God, in human form to come and subject himself to a wretched, sinful, evil, wicked humanity that crucifies him. 
and does it all so that they, they might be. He looks down at them on the cross and he goes, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Love. There's a guy, his name's Todd White, and he, he does this thing, and he, he's got a ministry, um, Lifestyle Evangelism, it's called. And he goes out in the streets, and he does, he, he literally does leg lengthenings, and it's a parlor trick. And another guy, Steve Kozar, filmed it and shows you how he's not actually healing anybody of a shorter leg. It's always a shorter leg. It's never blindness that gets healed. It's never deafness that gets healed. It's always a shorter leg. You'll never see Pete jump out of his wheelchair. You know, it's like they, they don't do that. They, they lengthen your leg. And he shows and he's saying, watch how I lengthened this leg. And Steve goes, now don't watch that leg. Watch the other leg. And what's happening is he's manipulating the other leg. And everyone's attention's on this leg being not, doing nothing. And he's pulling the other leg out or pushing it in, one or the other. And his big thing with unbelievers, he goes up to man, I just want you to know God loves you so much. He just, he just is so, he's enamored by you. He's fawning over you. And his, he just wants to pour his love out on you. And he just loves you. No, he's calling you to repent. Because the day is coming that he's going to judge the world in righteousness. I know that's hard. This is what this verse is saying, John 3, 16. For God's love for the world was expressed in the act of sending his only son to die on a cross that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, that, that love is directed at the cross towards humanity. It's not just directed towards humanity. The cross is the definitive act of self-sacrificial love which God displayed for all humanity. For through it, God extends the opportunity to be saved to every individual ever born during that individual's lifetime. Through it is displayed the self-sacrificial love act of the Father in sending Jesus to die for the sins of all. He loves Jesus. It pained him, and yet he, what it said, uh, it pleased him to send Jesus to die. Through it is displayed the self-sacrificial love of the Son in willing, willingly taking on this mission, knowing what he had to go through to do it, and, joy, and uh, joyfully did it. Of his own volition. Subjecting himself to sinful man and a painful death. Dying a heinous death on the cross at the hands of the very human beings he came to seek and to save. Jesus displayed his self-sacrificial love for sinful humanity. But understand this. No one burning forever in the lake of fire will proclaim the love of God towards them. No one. He's not li living, he's not up there right now going, oh, I love you all. I just love you all. And then the great white throne judgment comes and goes, now I hate you. I don't want to worship a bipolar God. Right? The love of God is expressed through the cross of Jesus Christ towards sinful humanity. And not only that, but a God who is gracious to all men, that everyone will be saved, right? That means a man who murdered six million Jews is going to be saved because God loves all the unbelievers. That means that the man that raped your daughter and killed her, he's going, he's going to be saved because God loves him too. And he, that means the guy that took your mother out and, and kidnapped her and starved her to death Buried in a hole, he's, God loves him too and, and he just loves. And what would you call a God like that? If this was happening in the real world and God were a judge in a court and he, he just said, no, I love them all. What would you call that judge? A Democrat. No, you would call him corrupt. You would call him unjust. If somebody did that to somebody you love and that judge ripped into him and said, how dare you think that you could appeal to my grace to get away from your sentence? 
and you show no remorse, take him and execute him. And then you'd go, justice was served. And now you know what happens at the great white throne judgment. 2 Peter 3, 9 through 10a. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. I don't even think I have to explain this to you. This lifetime is the expression of God's patience and long suffering. But the day is coming where he will move and act as the Lion of Judah and the judge. On that day, the great and fearful day of the Lord also known as the great white throne judgment. Finally, God's goodness will be manifest through his justice and his righteousness in the judgment of sinners. At the judgment, he will not act for the benefit, for the good of unbelievers and their sentence to eternal hell. He will, however, still be displaying his goodness to all of the redeemed. To all of his children by displaying his, righteous and his righteousness and justice in the punishment of those who are evil for all to witness. Vengeance indeed was his and his alone. And Psalm 11.5, his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. That's only one of like 35 verses regarding God's stance towards the unbeliever. Psalms 11.5, his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. He tolerates them. He's long-suffering towards them. He's being patient with them, but he hates them. The opportunity is theirs to, ch to change, to repent. And every day is that opportunity. Towards his children... His goodness will be manifest in the absence of an eternal sentence to the fires of hell. You see? We don't deserve heaven, but his goodness to us will be displayed towards us in the fact that we, our grace maintains at the great white throne judgment. Slide 13, please. In Exodus... Uh, Moses wanted to see God, and so God agreed to do it, and he appears to Moses. But he had to hide him in the cleft of a rock, because if he looked directly on God, he would have died. But he made it, and then he passes by. And this, as he passes by, he makes a proclamation. This is what he says. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Many declare in this world, the evil nature of God, that he is jealous and petty, vindictive and cruel. But those who truly know him, those who are regenerated, those who are his, God is the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. It's like they're screaming, you see how, how mean he is and how this, and you're like, no, no, you don't understand. He's merciful and gracious. Every day you can be saved. Please come to him. Cry out to him. But for some reason, some inexplicable reason, their hatred of him just grows more. Their rebellion towards him flourishes. And they march every day towards that day where he by no means clears the guilty. To us, his children, in this life, he showers daily with his chesed, his steadfast love and his mercy, not giving us what we deserve. And even you could say that to an extent to the unsaved, because in this life, they're not getting the fullness of what they deserve. Psalm 34, 3 through 5. Uh, three through eight, I'm sorry. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Remember I read that and we sung, let us exalt his name together forever. 
Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. There is not a single unsafe person who can rightfully declare God wicked, evil, vengeful, um, jealous. I mean, I'm talking in human terms. Every day is a chance for them to know him. He has given them this. And all they keep saying is, I want to run my own life. Thank you very much. I will not bow my knee to you. And he goes, tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow's another day. Every day. And he's not waiting going, oh, please, please come to me. He's not doing that. He, he did that already. James 1, 17 through 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The best of all good gifts, right? Every good gift and perfect gift is from above. The best gift, the most perfect gift is this, that you were brought forth by the word of truth and his Holy Spirit who empowers it. It was a gift. It was a gift. You didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it, and you didn't ask for it. When you asked for it, it was because he already gave it to you. The dead spirit does not cry out to God. Only the living one does. That we were brought forth. The reason we live, the reason we are sitting here now today, and the reason we can say we are saved, that we are born again, was entirely due to God and his goodness. Our good, good God, who by his will brought us forth from our mother's womb. Who by his will brought us forth again by his spirit. Regenerating our own spirits that they could both have the faith with, uh, by which grace works, it's saving work, and exercise this faith in crying out to him to save us from our fallen, sinful nature and their work, its works of death. Thank you, God. Born again into new life in Christ. Saved for all eternity to live in his grace. God is good. Amen? Amen.